Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I am talking to an amazing lady again today. Her name is Cindy Thomason, and she is normally on our show to talk about profit first for e-commerce sellers and her books keep e-commerce bookkeeping site. But today she is actually here to talk about her brand new book, Motherhood, Apple Pie, and all that happy horse shit. And I actually love this book and I love Cindy and what she's bringing to the table. She's an amazing mother, amazing e-commerce expert, bookkeeping expert, and just an amazing person. And she is going to talk to us today. We're going to have a great discussion about how moms often face the choice between continuing their career or starting their family and working from home. And the belief is that you have to choose, but the reality is you don't, you somehow cannot, you don't have to leave your heart in one place while you're walking to another. And Cindy is a speaker, a thought leader in the e-commerce community. And she is um, a fantastic way. We, we agree on so many things when it comes to this, especially that work-life balance is bogus and how we have to be present in the moment in each place that we're at. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Cindy Thomason to the show. Cindy, welcome back to the show. It's so good to have you back and for a different reason this time. So welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. I am excited to talk about the book. And of course, I just introduced the book and I'm going to say it again, but let's talk about this amazing <laughs> book and how it came about specifically this amazing title, which is Mother <laughs> Apple Pie and all that happy horse shit. And of course, it makes everyone go, what on earth could that mean? So can you tell us a little bit about the title and kind of how this is kind of came about? Sure. Um, the title came from my corporate days. Whenever uh, I was sitting in a boardroom, I was really invested in a, a organizational change effort. We wanted to restructure the, and put in teams, self-directed work teams. And I was sitting in the boardroom where they had to approve our proposal. And my boss had done the, you know, the, the full proposal and the board was just having none of it there. They were very command and control um, background of um, men. Oh, they were, I think all men at the time. And they were asking all kinds of picky detail questions about how could this possibly work? And um, the, the chairman of the board turned to me who I was sitting along the wall and he said, how does the staff feel about this? Well, I was really invested in it. And, um, you know, I stood up and I answered their question and I could tell, I, I just, I spoke from this place of passion and that was really kind of new for me. I, something just kind of came over me and I, I just, I said what I felt and my boss, I could see his eyes, they were just getting bigger and bigger, like, oh my gosh, who is this person and what is she doing to us? And at the end, one of the board members said, well, Cindy, that's all motherhood, apple pie and happy horse shit, but I don't think it's how to run, how you should run a company. And I was crushed. I, I really was like, I, I had given it my best shot, you know, and, and he was kind of shooting it down. Luckily, he followed that with, but I don't think it's the board, the board's place to decide how the, the business is run. I think that the um, the president of the organization should decide. And so it did kind of turn the tide and we did get what we wanted, but um, I, those words stung and, and they just kept playing over and over in my mind. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with motherhood? And, you know, and what's wrong with apple pie? I mean, to me, it kind of symbolizes, you know, um, small business and growth and the effort and hard work. I, I mean, you know, it, it, to me, it was always a good thing, but then he threw in and all that happy horse shit and just kind of negated it all. And um, as I've, as I've thought about it, working out in my garden, I've, I've decided, you know, uh, horse shit's good. It makes my stuff grow. So I, I just <laughs> decided, you know, let's turn this on its ear. Um, it, this is a, something he threw out kind of a flippant and negatively, um, but to me, it's all good stuff. I agree. And how you've turned that on to um, putting it into the, the space and the way you've organized it in the book to kind of make this framework for all of us to look at all that stuff, because I think you're so right. One of my favorite chapters is making your dreams a priority. So we'll get to that part of the book. And, you know, of course that aligns so much with what, what I believe and what I think for, for people, but that's what I loved about that is when you think of 
apple pie and you think of like you know the american dream they say it's it's as american as apple pie american as baseball american is something like this but also it's very american to think about living our dreams right and when we when when someone says something so flippantly like that you almost want to put your hands on your hips and wait just a darn minute let me tell you about the horse shit you're talking about (laughs) (laughs) so i totally totally get that and i think most of the moms or and i even want to say now not just motherhood but but um there's a lot of parenthood out there now that like the tables have turned and there's more and more dads being involved. And I know how that's addressed in your book, as far as, you know, having equal support, there's no pink and blue tasks. We're just helpful, supportive partners. And I love how that's addressed as well in there. Well, and, and, you know, since the book has come out, I'm hearing from grandmothers that are taking care of grandchildren and are going through some of the same kinds of struggles of trying to, you know, to figure out what's important to them. Of course, they love their family and they want to to be there to help with their grandchildren, but they kind of have gotten lost a little bit in the way of, you know, being that caregiver or soul support for a grandchild too. So it's just even multi-generational, I think. Absolutely. And, and it's crossing um, generations, it's crossing genders, it's cro- crossing, um, breaking the not the traditional roles that we've all have set up in, in, you know, from years past, or just how we've maybe have been raised and deciding that, um, you know, we don't have to, it, it's not necessarily even about motherhood, fatherhood, pa- it's parenthood versus the corporate world almost. And how, um, you know, you're shaping our minds to be able to help us know that we can have it all on our own terms. Um, it's just going to be about organization and, and having a certain set of boundaries and uh, maybe reframing our expectations. So what kind of prompted you to decide that this was a full book worthy of writing here? Well, gosh, I, I don't know that I thought it about it quite like that. I, I, I did think about it from the standpoint of my reader and who I felt like um, I wanted to feel empowered to make a different choice. I I was thinking about myself um, 20 some years ago, faced with leaving that corporate job that I had worked at and loved and um, raising my daughter. And for me, I, that was my either or choice. I didn't think about there being a third choice in the middle and there's probably four or five other choices, but for me, I, um, I left the workforce uh, because I I knew I wanted to be a very focused mom. I wanted to be a very involved mom and financially we could afford that. Um, What I didn't count on was how much I was gonna miss that corporate world. And it's not even the corporate world. It's really just the the achievement mentality, you know, the the personal and professional growth that you have when when you are working on something. And and that was really a struggle for me. I really felt lost after I had my daughter that I um, I look at at it now and I think, you know, I was really an achievement junkie. I just wanted to check my stuff off and get stuff done. And, and, you know, changing diapers and and all of that, you know, it's where I wanted to be. It was a big decision that I made. I didn't, I didn't count on losing myself in that process. You know, that is such an important message for anyone out there that, because let's be honest, like there there's, we're a whole person, right? And so we have compartments. And I think that, I mean, I'm not going to stereotype here or even generalize, but as my experience dictates, I tend to be very different from my husband as far as he's, he's so good at putting everything in a different compartment and just closing the box and be like, okay, this is the work box. This is the emotional box, you know, all those things to where me, it's like all this jumbled yarn of mess. And so when I was changing diapers and just kind of being in the day-to-day minutia of mom, I felt so guilty that I didn't enjoy those processes because it's like, okay, does anyone really enjoy changing diapers or cleaning up spit up or, you know, any sort of the piles and piles of laundry? Well, some maybe do, but I, there was that piece of you that ends up being missing. And then we feel guilty for longing for those achievements, for those work um, related type of uh, motivations that we have that complete us as a person. And so I think, and especially in the beginning of new moms, we struggle with, with like feeling like a whole 
person. Like I, can you have to be either mom or career person or business owner and not both at the same time when I love how your book just wraps it all into, yes, you can. And we are allowed to, and we are allowed to uh, want and long for the different things. One of my favorite lines is actually on the back. And, you know, you say either choice leaves us with a part of our hearts behind, and it doesn't have to be this way. And I think in the beginning, we, we do that push pull of the guilt and the shame of like, I thought I would really just dote over this baby and love them 24 seven. And I would be full and complete. And you find yourself in that depression stage feeling like, yeah, but the other side of me is really missing that to do kind of like, I don't, I'm, I'm very motivated by those same things as well. The achievement junkie was very, that's very interesting the way you put that. And so I think, you know, what the balance there, I think is what we're all longing for. Yeah. And, and, and the, the challenge is really a balance is this, um, this bogus. Is- Right. Yeah, and it's a state of perfection <laughs> mm-hmm. that we really never get to, but you can integrate things. And when you integrate them, you can, you can pay attention to the important things at the time that they need the attention and realize that, uh, that that's going to be different every day. And, um, and that there's no magic to making it smooth all the time. It's going to be, it's going to be a juggling act and it's, it's it, it is no matter what you're, um, whether you're staying at home and, and focusing on child raising or whether you're, you're working and trying to, you know, use a daycare scenario or, um, or trying to do a business. It's always going to be a juggling act. What I like about the idea of being a small business owner in the mix is that you get to control all the balls and you get to say for yourself, this is important right now. And this is where I'm going to put my time. Yes. Okay. I know I, they would, as soon as you said that, that triggered another one of my like flags in the book here about um, the juggling acts and about the balls that are glass versus rubber. And I know some people have heard that before. Um, and, and just looking at it in that perspective, um, I love that part of it. I'm not even giving it all away. Everyone, you need to go and get the book and read it. Now you can get it on Amazon. All the links are also going to be in the show notes and below this video, but we're still going to dive in because there's something you talk about. There's key pieces of this puzzle that we're going to kind of unravel here that moms need to understand if they want to have both family and business. And as both of us, as being able to have done this for many years now, um, there's just so many golden nuggets in here. And let's talk about a little bit about that personal side, because I think that for moms, um, at least from my, from my experience, and I think from yours by reading your book, um, is that that's the part that gets lost the most. We can figure out the motherhood thing and focus our natural abilities our, to nurture and focus on our children and our child and those relationships. And then with work, it's that it's that uh, motivation and drive for that achievement or that that success or whatever it is that's driving us. And then there's this piece over here, <laughs> this sacred space, this uh, self and what you call it in your framework. Um, I'm like, I haven't memorized, so I don't know, but um, uh, is, is that piece of us that that's our own, it's ourself. That's the, um, <laughs> that's the happy horse shit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's where we all get happy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that type of space, how you can, you know, the personal side of it, because I feel like we all can figure out the the business. A lot of us are, you know, really well, you know, we all have different careers and different things like that. But I feel like with women, especially, we tend to put ourselves always last and we, we tend to think, okay, once we get the kids raised and the business going and all this other stuff, then we can take care of ourselves. And it's so opposite. So why don't you unfold that a little bit about the sacred space and what you talk about in the book about finding that and keeping it sacred? Well, I, I think it's the key ingredient. And, and for, for me, the, um, what I discovered personally, and then after interviewing, you know, a dozen moms, it, it was true for all of them. So I really wanted to highlight it. What happened for me um, when I was raising my daughter and feeling totally overwhelmed, I, I realized that I was really losing myself. And then that happened again when I was, uh, my daughter was actually uh, a foreign exchange student. She was in Brazil and I had poured myself into work and I was spending so much time at work. And I remember um, standing in this office and looking out this window and seeing my garden and, uh, you know, I hadn't been in it and it was weedy and there was no mulch and it needed so much attention. And I just cried and I'm like, I, I, why am I working so hard? I can't even go do the thing that I enjoy. 
both times I realized that I had lost myself. I had lost what was really important to me. And I think that's the key for, um, for people in general to stay, to stay in that place of wholeness and to be able to make good decisions, um, whether it's child rearing decisions or whether it's you know, business decisions. If you're feeling totally depleted, you're not in a good place to make decisions. For me, what I, what I did both times to get out of that situation was I made more time for myself. Um, gardening's always been important to me. So uh, when my daughter was little, I was, um, I found a babysitter, a college student who came in. She spent a couple of hours there, a couple of days a week. And I went out in the yard. I went out into my garden and just had time to be by myself. And, and when you're able to find that thing that you enjoy, for me, it's gardening. It may be, you know, jogging for someone. It could be many, many different things for different people. That's the thing. You get to figure it out for your, for what it is for you, but it's that thing that when you're doing it, you just lose track of time. You, you're not thinking about, okay, which bills do I have to pay? And when do I have to feed the baby again? You just can, you're so involved in it that you, um, you're in that flow and you lose track of time. There was, um, uh, a really great professor back, um, he's been dead a few years now, he's written several books, Joseph Campbell, mm. and he, he calls it um, uh, your bliss station, and he really encouraged his students to find that one thing that they enjoy, and just by doing that, you're in a better place to, to do all the other things in your life. Here recently, um, there's a book out by Marcus Buckingham called Love Plus Work, and he's done work with the Mayo Clinic and they determined for the medical team at the Mayo Clinic, if they can spend 20% of their day doing the thing that they love, that's when they're in their happiest place and, and enjoy their work. And it's much more satisfying to them. So it doesn't have to be that you know, everything is sunshine and roses all the time. Mm -hmm. But if you can just carve out a little bit of time for yourself and, and stay in touch with what's really important to you, then then everything else gets easier. And, you know, I, I've been out talking to moms a lot. I've been doing a lot of readings and um, groups. Um, and afterwards, that's the thing that I get asked about the most is I, I know I have passion, but I don't know what it is. And I'm, I just feel lost. And it's not a business thing. It's a personal thing. And, and I kind of think it may be a little bit of an epidemic that we have in the country. And maybe the pandemic helped it a little bit. You know, I, I know right now there's the great resignation. Maybe people are getting a little bit more in touch with what really fulfills them and making some choices like that. I think you're, you're so right about all those things. I think too, when you say it's a little bit of an epidemic, there's, there's so much hope though, in this day and age that there's so much information and there's so uh, many more ways to connect with other people that feel the very same. I remember, you know, my, my children are, are grown now really. So, I mean, I do still have one younger one. Uh, she's 11 and a half. Um, but the other two are 21 and 19. And, um, you know, they're kind of growing and doing their own thing. And I think, you know, 20 reminding 20 years ago, um, there wasn't a lot of ways I could connect with other moms and even share that or I was embarrassed to share it I was embarrassed to admit or ashamed to admit that, um, motherhood is great. That's just one part of me. And I love it. And I love my children and I accept my responsibilities and I enjoy that part. But I also, you know, I got so lost. I, I realized, and someone said, well, what are some of your hobbies? And I thought, a deer in the headlights came over me. And I just thought, do I even have hobbies? Like, well, what do you enjoy doing? And I'm thinking at that moment, it was sleep. <laughs> I wasn't getting a whole lot of that. A but shower is really great. <laughs> yes. Like a really hot, uninterrupted shower, a cup of coffee without it being spilled on me. Cause the toddler comes and bumps it, you know, things like that. I was like, what do I enjoy? And I thought to myself, when I was asked that, when my children were still kind of young, I thought, I, I don't know. I don't know me. I don't even know who I am or what I'm doing here. I'm just like trying it was, you're like survival mode. And I think as the kids start to get older, that becomes a little bit more prominent and thinking, you know, who am I as a person? And I think giving ourselves, you know, you calling it that sacred space. Um, then one of the things that you said that resonated the most, even with me was the time to just be able to think 
to time to be able to digest and process all the things that are coming at us in all directions all the time. And if we're constantly putting things in there, we're required to make decisions and make money decisions and make parenting decisions and relational decisions and going into the garden and working with horseshit really sounds like a bliss because it's one place where you, no one's demanding anything from you. You don't have to make any big decisions that don't make you happy. And I thought, I need a sacred space like that as well. And so many moms need that to be able to create a space, whatever that means. And without judgment, if it's you and your garden, great for me, I play cornhole <laughs> and I really, really enjoy um, being able to put on music and not think about anything else, except for just moving my body in a beautiful sunshiny area without worrying about what else is, is coming at me. There's no decisions to be made. And I, I absolutely love that space for myself. Good for you. Good for you for, for making the time for that. Well, because I was either, it was like one of those glass balls you were talking about. Mine was, if it was going to fall down, it was for sure going to shatter. So we had to do something to make sure I was creating the sacred space. So let's talk about a little bit about the business side of, of this book and how we're integrating. Cause we both agree that, um, I mean, I, I read it in your book, so we can talk about that, that balance is really kind of bogus, this work-life balance thing that everyone's talking about and, and how we kind of align that that's just a matter. That's just something people say, but in reality, it's, it's, it's more of a juggling act and more of a, where we're going to sacrifice in what ways today or tomorrow or in the future, because the real balance just isn't there. You've got to be fully present in the moment, wherever you are. Um, and so talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, the whole, the whole idea of glass balls and rubber balls came, came out of a speech that the CEO of Coca-Cola gave back in, I think, 96. And he, you know, I mean, I give him a lot of credit. He was thinking about, you know, the work bucket and the family bucket and the self-care bucket. And I think he had five of them. But as I was thinking about that and, and talking with one of the moms, she made it clear to me, hey, if I only had five balls up in the air, I would feel like this is a piece of cake. <laughs> but I'm looking at the ball practice for this kid and the game for this other kid and my yoga class and, and you know, this uh, deadline I have for my job and, you know, carpooling to get the kids to school. And she said, there are just so many balls up in, in the air. And, you know, then, then you put the, you know, your extended family, like maybe your mom needs care or your, your dad or grandparent, you put all of that together. And in a day, we're pulled in so many different directions. So um, to, to me, the idea is um, look at those things coming from a place where you will have taken care of yourself, because that to me is not negotiable, but um, look at those things and then decide, okay, this is a rubber ball. It can move to tomorrow. We're just going to bounce it on over to tomorrow. These things are the, the critical things that I can't pass off and they, they will shatter if they fall to the ground. So those are the things that have to get our attention. And um, just by, for me, making that happen week by week is a weekly planning exercise. And my week doesn't very often go according to my plan, but, but just by thinking about it on Sunday night and kind of putting those uh, glass balls in a day uh, and the rubber balls in a day, then I know what they are. And I know, okay, this one, if I don't get to it, I'm just going to move it over. And, um, and then every day I have to look at it and make some decisions. But, but the weekly planning um, around those things really has been a big help to me personally. And, and all the moms that I talked to, one of the biggest um, I would say the biggest thing that everyone said that that was a, a life hack for them was time blocking on their calendar. Time blocking is so important, especially for those things that are glass balls. You know, at one point, my husband and I used to joke about uh, a joke about it because it was he he used to come and say, you know, well, is, is there any time on my on your calendar for me? You know, and although it seems like a little sarcastic and kind of rude, it's actually really true um, because we were finding even as a couple that with kids and busy and schedule and works and all the different things that we have going on, like we were strangers passing in, in different places or looking like an organizational mess of like, hey, how are you? You know, 
kind of more like that. And so uh, we used to joke about which day are we, you know, scheduling a, a day date, a coffee date, it's something where we can just do something that we enjoy together. And one of those things for us has been joining a cornhole league so we can play together and both have our hobby and our kind of date night all on the same thing. And, you know, we've really, really enjoyed that and even reclaimed a even happier state in our relationship by creating sacred space for us and for the things that we love doing and not feeling guilty about it. And I think that's one of the, the biggest things when you have a busy family and you have businesses and all these other things to, uh, not have the guilt about scheduling time for yourself. So how have you like, kind of, have you ever experienced that guilt? And if you have, like, how have you gotten a little bit rid of it or have owned it for, I don't have to feel guilty about this. I actually look forward to it. Oh yeah, I definitely look forward to it. Um, but it, it, it's easy to feel the guilt. I mean, my daughter's 23. Um, she's off doing her own thing. I, I'm excited. Actually, she is here right now for a long weekend, but, um, I remember even as, as she was, um, I don't know, 19 or 20, she would come and sit in this chair in the corner of my office and just sit there like, and I'm like, uh, can I help you? <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm off this afternoon. I thought maybe we could do something. And I'm like, well, you know, and immediately you feel guilty because you want to spend time with her, but you, I didn't plan to be off. And I, you know, I have things I have to do that I'm commitments to other people. And, and honestly, writing the book helped me get much more in perspective about it because it really made me examine my job as a parent and the boundaries that um, that I wish I had created. Honestly, I think I could have done a lot better job at it. Um, in the book, I tell the alternative story about um, Shel Silverstein's um, book, The Giving Tree, mm -hmm. and, and Topher Payne has written a different ending um, where boundaries are respected. You know, in the original book, the tree gives up everything, is cut down and built a house, and, mm -hmm. and in the alternative ending, Topher says, the tree says, hey, wait a minute, I'm not going down like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I've given you the apples, and I've let you have, you know, branches, but no, you're not cutting me off, I'm not going to be a stump, and, and I think in hindsight, I wish I had felt um, a better, um, more empowered around boundaries. I, I, that, that's, you know, where I wish I had done some things a little differently. Love my daughter, love to spend time with her. Um, but at the same time, I didn't make the time for sacred space that I should have. Well, and I appreciate you being upfront and honest about that, because I really feel like it helps a lot of us. I think, you know, once your kids are growing up and you realize, you know, the hindsight type of things, you realize that they, and I'm saying this all to moms, when you have like children, especially if they're under five right now, <laughs> I mean, we're speaking from a place where we have grown children and I still have one younger. So I, I'm balancing this, but I feel like it's a lot healthier. I'm going to tell a little bit of a story here because of the same, same things that you were talking about learning from the older ones and realizing like the things that maybe that the moms don't know right now, right? Like they don't know you think in your heart or your head that you're damaging them, or they're going to somehow remember this moment in time that you chose work over them. But in general, what they really realize is they learn to respect your boundaries when you do set them. And when they were young, my older ones were younger, I didn't necessarily say it was all really about them and their schedule and their time. And I worked around that rather than showing them that we all work together around each other's passions. And so with my younger one, um, when we recently joined the Cornhole League that we were in, that took us in the evening, one, e one evening a week away from the house and we were going together. So it was either siblings were babysitting. I mean, she's almost old enough to be by herself, um, but her older siblings were here. And so we, I, the first time we left, she was clinging and she was struggling. She's like, you guys are leaving for a whole night. And like, she just like could not get over it. And then I, I felt so guilty. I left, I didn't do well. I was in the wrong headspace when I went, but I thought, okay, this will maybe get easier. And at their, the third week of us going, it was bye bye. Mom, we'll see you later because I came home as a whole person. I got to date night with my husband. I got to do something that was really fun, exciting, and important to me. She sees that we value that and we also value her. And it was revolutionary to get past that first feeling of she's going to feel bad. She's going to call us every second, like all these things to where 
to where she's like, okay, see you later. Have fun at your thing because she's relating it to her own world. When she gets to go to dance class, she's separate from us, but she's not disappointed. She's like, when you go to dance, how you're excited, right? And you want to go and have this good time. You're spending it in yourself. And so I related that to uh, us going away and doing our thing and how important that was to, to us. And all of a sudden her, uh, the guilt turned into, or the, the, her missing us turned into, oh, mom's going to do her fun thing. I like fun things. And so relating that gave us the boundary, her to respect the boundary, but also us to do that and her to understand and relate that. Now, when they're younger, they don't, but um, that was such a freeing thing to be able to create those boundaries and say, no, every Wednesday night, this is what mom and dad do. And you know, you're well cared for and you have your things. It also forced her to be a little bit more independent, which she was nervous about. And now she's proud of herself. She's proud of herself that she's like, I can brush my teeth and get myself into bed, say goodnight to my brother, like all these things. And without, you know, feeling that. So I think what we're initially scared of, we can actually find success in if we're willing to kind of set those boundaries and keep them in place. Yeah, that's a great story. And, and the other thing that that's really important is what you're modeling for her is going to be something that she can then use in her own life. I mean, it's great that she sees the connection to your fun thing and her fun thing. But then think of it later down the road when she's juggling a family and she can say, you know, mom did the things that she needed to do. So you're setting such a great example that I, I anticipate will carry her, you know, throughout her life. So I, I think that's a, one of the things that we we lose sight of when we're thinking when we get caught in that mom guilt is that our kids are watching and you know if we want to be a strong whole person for them we have to take strong positions and boundaries help with that and so uh you know, if, if you're, if you're finding it hard to do it for yourself, then do it for your child because they're paying attention and you can set a good example for them that also benefits you too. Absolutely. And I love that you said that too, because how else are we going to teach them how to be strong and how to have boundaries, not only for their workplace or for their happy place, but to protect themselves in relationships and other things that, you know, you are, you are a whole person and you have responsibilities and you have, you're, you're supposed to be a good human and be kind and work and, you know, take all those responsibilities as well, but there's always time to, to be fun. And I think that that's another thing I was able to explain to her as well, is that like that I'm I am also a whole person. I am a mom, but I'm also all of these other things. And as I was going through some of the roles and talking to her about that, her eyes kind of widened like, wow, to her, I'm mom. But yeah. like, she didn't realize that, oh yeah, you are a mom and a sister and a daughter and you're a mom to two other people. And you're also a business owner of not one, but two businesses, <laughs> a household member, a member of a church, a member of this group. And that she's like, oh, wow, you do really a lot of things. And so I think also that perspective is, is, um, helpful for them to realize too, that these are all the things we can also incorporate and do some of them together. It doesn't all have to be in separate boxes, but as a whole person, what makes you feel happy and whole is all the parts and pieces put together like, like that. So Okay, let's talk a little because we only have a few minutes left. Let's talk about this, the framework that you talk about in um, one of the last chapters here and how we can kind of start incorporating this into our everyday life. Well, um, you know, when the, the title came about, um, I started thinking about the motherhood component, the apple pie component being the business component and the happy horseshit being all that stuff that we do for ourselves. Um, that was how things were rolling around in my head as I was organizing the book. But then as I really started working on the things that I do from a time management perspective, I realized that it carried through to that level as well. So, you know, there are these tasks that we have to do that are um, that are, are surrounding our motherhood roles and the same with business and and with our personal stuff. And let me let me grab it here. So I um, have it in front of me as well. Um, and, and then the thing that uh, after after coming up with the framework that I felt like really did have to go in there was distractions um, because I've just seen, and that wasn't as much of a, a factor when my daughter was young and probably for you raising your, your um, older children, um, but the iPhone in every hand was not a thing and now it is. And it is for me as a parent, as well as it is now for my, my adult daughter, but um, even small children now have had these devices 
and it's really easy to get lost in some of the distractions. But but the the first section is on mothering. Um, you know the the relationship that you have, teaching, nurturing your children, the partnership that you have with your spouse or or um, whoever your partner is in in parenting. And then there's just all the family management stuff. I mean, you, you, we got to keep the calendar going. We got to feed these little children. You know, there's just all of this. You know, that's the hardest decision sometimes. What are we going to have for dinner? So all of those. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, we have to pause there for a second because I swear, I literally. Like, I think one of my kids said this to me the other day. They're like, "Mom, you make decisions all day, big deals. You're closing contracts and this and that." But it goes when it comes time for dinner, you can't make a decision to save your life. <laughs> It's called decision fatigue. That's exactly what I told them. I said, because I've made so many decisions all day, I don't have, I can't think about dinner anymore. I said, so either it has to be pre-planned or somebody else takes care of it. And I said, there's also five of us and none of us like all the same things. So that's even harder. And I'm trying to please everybody. I said, forget it. If everyone's just on their own, and if there's enough here to feed yourself, then I don't have to make a meal that makes four out of five people unhappy anyway. So it was kind of funny that you said that because it literally is those types of things that are like that get the family management sometimes is the hardest part of, of motherhood in general. Yeah. Who's going to take this one to the doctor and also get this other one to the ball game? And uh, yeah, it's crazy. Then the apple pie piece um, is the business piece. And I like to think about, I, I like to call out, there's this business management piece where you have to do, you know, if you're a solopreneur, it's you, you really have to do everything. But then there's the design piece. And it's the piece that I, when working with other uh, clients, that I see that people neglect. And it, it's kind of the sacred space for your business, if you will, but you have to have time to actually work on your business. This isn't a new concept, but it is a concept that people don't pay enough attention to. And so making sure that you have enough resources and support in place that you actually spend some strategic time thinking about the business as well. So that's all the um, apple pie piece. And then the, the oxygen is the, part of the happy horseshit. We have uh, oxygen, we have um, the um, oh, uh, the sacred space. And those, those are two different things. I want people to understand that self-care is really not sacred space. Um, yes, it's nice to get a shower and, uh, uh, but those really are, um, you should have the time to take care of yourself. That shouldn't be a bonus. Um, you shouldn't. Okay. Have let's, let's spend a few minutes defining that. Cause I think that it's a little, the word has been taken over and has taken on some different meanings when it comes to self-care. So some of us have been taught that self-care is, you know, spending 15 minutes reading a lovely book like this one, or having your quiet coffee. And other times, you know, just talking about self-care meaning like, a hot shower every day is, is like not, it's not non-negotiable. So let's define self-care in, in the terms we're talking about it so that we can build from that. Okay. Well, it, it, you know, to me, it, it's taking care of you. It includes rest. It's, it's the thing that makes you, um, that, that, that allows you to take care of this body that we have. It's eating right. It's exercising. It's, um, it's taking the rest that you need. Um, you know, um, I'll, I'll just read a little bit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. To achieve your goals, you have to take care of you, much as flight attendants instruct you to put your own oxygen mask on uh, before assisting others, you need to make self-care and rest a priority. Without it, all your other activities will be harder and feel less meaningful. Self-care activities and rest nourish your mind and body in positive ways and improve your sense of well-being. Outside of the newborn time bubble where everything can get rather cattywampus, self-care is not attending to your basic hygiene and nutritional needs. Don't settle for a shower, a balanced meal, and sleep for yourself. Those are basic human needs. Self-care addresses your higher level needs. So Love that. You know, Thank you yeah. for reading that piece, because I think that was good to clarify what we're speaking about when we're talking about not your basic human needs like showering and eating and sleeping, but actually getting yourself in a place of 
renewal and, and being, feeling, walking away from whatever that self-care is feeling like a whole person. For me, sometimes that it's my Friday yoga class. My Friday yoga class at one o'clock is literally the sacred space that no one's allowed to invade because for me, without my Friday yoga class, I'm not whole. I'm just not, you don't want to talk to me if I don't have my Friday yoga (laughs) class. For you for having that, you know. Mm -hmm. Because so many of us just give up on those kinds of things. We, we just, we get too busy and we don't put ourselves as a priority. And um, that's a very recent thing as of 2022, because it was, I was feeling like, um, you know, I wasn't, I was doing the basic human need thing, but I thought that was just enough. And the reality is it's not enough for most of us. And we're not built to always serve and always work and always consume. We are built for rest in some ways. And that include not, not just sleep, but rest from decisions, rest from bombardment and confusion rest from the damn phone that's literally an attachment to our hands and I only say that with frustration because it's all of our problems these days we all I mean it's literally no longer two feet from me at any given moment yeah when it is you start to get panicky like where's my phone you know (laughs) I know right well and I'm type one diabetic and my my blood sugar um monitor is hooked to it now. So I literally, it's like Bluetooth. So if I am more than 25 feet away from it, it could cause death. (laughs) It doesn't really cause death, but it can prevent it if it it goes off. So it is one of those things where we believe and we have just been trained and and kind of it's the new norm that this is a lifeline. And so having being disconnected from that is also something that we need to give ourselves that the self-care sometimes just means time to breathe and think without anything else coming at us, including consumption from a phone. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's another piece that I I throw in that chapter is this distracted disservice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many, um, there's so many tools that are available now that you can set up on your phone just to know how much time are you actually spending looking at Facebook or whatever it is on your phone. And I think people need to pay attention to that because it's not fulfilling. It's not fulfilling in the way that actual, actual rest is fulfilling. Um, Finding that um, activity that's in your sacred space. It's, it's not the same thing. And yes, you're, you may not be doing active childcare at that moment and you're use, but you're using it as a distraction instead of actually doing something that could boost you up as opposed to just numb you a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, that's so true. Numbing versus fulfilling is that sometimes we, we, what we're really craving inside when we turn to our phones or just scroll somewhere is rest. We're looking to release all of the pressure or all of the stress or all of the things that have been coming at us. I struggled with this after work almost every day. And that's the reason why I've integrated cornhole into my life, because as I'm sitting in this space, and most of the time I'm sitting and interviewing or creating or doing all these things at the end of the day, uh, I need to get up and exit from here and have something else to do. And instead of going and sitting in another chair and scrolling (laughs) mindlessly, I'm like, what do I need? And I think think that's maybe part of what we can kind of leave people with right now is that number one, first of all, is that you got to get the book. You got to get the book. Um, It's on Amazon. The links are going to be all below this video, but this is worth your sacred space. It is worth your time. It is worth your energy. You will learn something from it. Even if you have the same concepts and ideas, the way that it's laid out. And I love one of my favorite things too, is the little progress nuggets. I mean, I love the fact this is my favorite one so far. And it's, it's just, there's little progress nuggets in here where um, little quotes and different things are just kind of pop up on these pages and give you these prog- progress nuggets. And it says May 14th is National Apple Pie Day in the United States. What do you want to be? What do you want to be different about your life by Apple Pie Day next year? And I was just like, I need some sacred space to think about that question. And so I'm thanking you from the bottom of my heart for that question because I struggled to move past that page because I had to give myself some space to think about that question in one year. And it's almost a year. It's a little less than a year now, (laughs) but like, because of that, I'm thinking I have a year 
what in next year do I want to be different about my life? And without being asked that, I might not have given that any thought, but because it kind of stopped me in my tracks. And now that I have and know I have a dedicated space that I think about such things, I'm really excited and have been unpacking that for myself. So thank you for the, for the progress nuggets. Um, but just any, just any final thoughts, any key takeaways that you thought, if you, if you get nothing else from even this interview, what is the one thing that, that our listeners can walk away with? The thing that, that has um, really surprised me as I've been out talking to people about the book is I, I asked them to write down on an um, index card on the front, the three people you could call if you had a, a, biz, a, a business need that you needed some kind of support for. And then on the back, the three people you could call if you had a family emergency and you needed someone to, to step in. And I thought, okay, this is going to be a two minute thing. Everybody jot their thing down, but I'm watching and people are thinking and they're writing and they're struggling. And, you know, after five minutes, I'm like, okay, is everybody done? No. And I'm like, okay. And so it's really been a surprise to me that people don't have the support that they've really thought about and, and developed in their life. So that's the one thing that I think everybody can do is spend, you know, 15 minutes right now, write down who are you going to call if you need somebody? And it can't be your spouse because if, I mean, you're asking them for stuff all the time or anyway, mm -hmm. right? So who, who else can you call? If something happens, who are you going to call? And, and then reach out to that person and say, hey, you know, I've just been thinking about this and I just want you on my team and I'm, I'll be on your team too. I mean, it can be a reciprocity thing or it can be the thing where you, you're going to pay it forward down the road. If, you're, if you just don't have the time, don't make that be a reason not to do it, but find, find three people that you can um, count on for help personally and in your business. And we don't want to be thinking about those things in the moment when they happen. We kind of want to, to know this is my person. They already are on board and I'm going to call them right now. Yeah, that is so important, especially, you know, those relationships. And, you know, I love the challenge of thinking of that because as af after you said that, I'm thinking, I got to make my list of that. And could I, and would it take me long enough? And would it not, you know, as far as those things are support is everything and understanding that even if you're a solopreneur, a mom, a dad, anyone out there kind of doing it on your own, you don't have to do it on your own. There's always people around you that can support you. And if you don't have that, one of the places you can come to get it is my Facebook group <laughs> course, uh, mommyincome.com forward slash join us. And your code word is apple pie. And if you want to join us in there, there's support support for you. That's the whole point is that if you find that you don't have uh, a support from a spouse or a partner, or, um, you know, there's not a lot of people business-wise or even, um, even in relationship wise, people that don't understand you, or you're not in the same space in the world. Um, the, the good news is, is that there's a place for you to belong. There's a place where you can come, you can ask questions. You're not going to be judged. If you are, let me know and I'll kick the person out. <laughs> um, but seriously, this is a place where you can come and talk about the motherhood and the apple pie and the happy horse shit, because we talk about everything because we're whole people. So whether you're mom, dad, anything else, mommyincome.com forward slash join us code word, apple pie, why code words? Cause we don't like spammers and we don't want people jumping in there and hijacking all the information, right? You got to be qualified to kind of come in there. And so you guys go to Amazon. It's on Audible. It's on Kindle. And of course, I love to hold books and write in them and leave sticky notes all over them because it's so important to revisit and go back to even some of the golden nuggets every day. This is self-care. People reading books and consuming things that are going to make you a better person is worth your time. The reason that I am the way I am is because of the books that I read and the people that I meet and the conversations I have, they all contribute to helping us make a better person. So make time for yourself, get the book from Cindy and there, all the links are below this video. No excuses. You have Amazon, you have Kindle, you have all this stuff. So go get the book and Cindy, how can everyone connect with you after this? Because you're such an amazing person and people want to, you're going to want to reach out and learn more. 
Thank you, Kristen. Um, CindyThomason.com. And, um, you know, I've written another book that we've talked about before, The Profit, Ver uh, mm -hmm. Profit First for E-Commerce Sellers. So when you go there, there's um, both books are there, but but the motherhood book is, is the one we're talking about today. Absolutely. And just so you guys know, listening all the way here to the end, Cindy has been on several of the other Amazon Files podcast episodes. I think number 222, not too long ago, maybe last year. So um, search her name in the search box and listen to her other episode as well because she's a really smart lady she does bookkeeping in her agency there and um she what tell us briefly about books keep just also well we're an e-commerce accounting firm um we uh specialize in helping our uh um, e-commerce clients uh, get profitable and stay profitable through the profit first methodology. Uh, we're a fully remote organization. We have about 26 people on staff now all, all around um, all around the US. And what I what I really love is that we've been able to create a business that allows our team members the flexibility to have the the time that they need in their family. So part of what uh, has motivated me to write this book has been really seeing that moms need this. Not everybody wants to have a, um, a business, but you can have it in a career too, if you find an organization that will support that. And that's what we're really striving to do for our team. Awesome. Well, all the information can be found on Cindy, cindythomason.com. You can learn about books. Keep there. You can get the book, the books on Amazon, Audible, everything else. Cindy, thank you so much for your time and for your inspiration and motivation here. This book is so helpful. It's helpful for anyone. It can be small. It can be large, but it's so worth the read. You guys don't, if you need summer reading, this is it. Small chunks, big chunks. It will change your life. You can't unlearn what you learn. So um, go out and learn from Cindy here, there. Thank you. You guys, I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast, and we'll see you same time, same place next week on the show. Thank you, Cindy, for joining us. Thank you, Kristen.